There is so much in this genre, it is amazing. Let me go ahead and begin with a clip from uh, the series on, uh, it's becoming a series, it's actually the show Batman vs. Superman, which came out the tail end of last year, and it is fascinating to see one particular scene from this clip it's about the Superman character, or the Kal-El character, the Kryptonian character, going to Mexico City, where they have a celebration once a year called the Day of the Dead celebration, where people dress up in masks or wear uh, skeleton type uh, uh, makeup. In that area, there was a fire, and there was a little girl caught in a fire. And the Kal-El alien super creature called Superman goes into this fire and pulls her out. Notice the reaction of the people and of the media. Listen to how that is engaging. You notice in that scene, the character of Superman takes on a persona of a type of a demigod almost. Where people begin to long to worship because it is so awesome and so different and so godlike. The every nation in the history of the world has in one form or another worshipped. You'll find it in the most remote tribes. They either be worshipping the sun or worshipping some type of totem or some type of land or a god or goddesses of some sort or another. The modern world has shifted, hasn't it? The secular world. We say we don't worship. We have grown beyond that, haven't we? Really? I want you to listen to the words of one secularist, his name is David Foster Wallace, who gave a commencement address at the graduation ceremony in Kenton College in 2005. Listen to his words. Because here's something else that's weird but true. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everyone worships. The only choice we have is what to worship. The compelling reason for many in choosing some sort of God or spiritual life thing to worship, whether it's JC, Allah, Yahweh, or the wicked mother goddess, or the four noble truths, or some invaluable set of ethical principles, is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap your real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel like you have enough. It is the truth. Worship your body and beauty, and you will never feel beautiful. Worship sexual allure, and you will find that these things disappear through age. And finally, as you worship your beauty, you will die a thousand deaths before they actually grieve you. On one level, we all know this stuff already. It's codified in myths and proverbs and stories and legends. The whole trick is keeping the truth before our eyes. Worship power, and you'll end up feeling weak and afraid. You will never, ever have enough, and you will try to have more power as it numbs you to take over those under you. Worship your intellect. It's trying to be seen as smart. You'll end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out, always comparing yourself to others. The insidious thing about these types of worship is that it's not that they're evil or sinful, it's that they're unconscious. They are the default setting of man. Of course, we would disagree about it being sinful, won't we? This is coming from a secularist. And David Foster Wallace, unfortunately, three years later, committed suicide at the age of 46. He had embodied in his own life the problems that he's seen in worship. Do we worship as a secular people? I think we do. And we need to point that out to our secular friends. What is it that you worship? It may be a different type of worship, but nevertheless, it is a type a form of, of gratitude and giving over. Now in the old days, the mythologies of the old, uh, of course you have Poseidon, Hercules, Zeus, Hera, Thor, and these other great mythological figures that people would look up to as great stories and myths. Some people actually believe them to be real. If you read the Plato's Republic, you'll see some indications of that, especially regarding Hades and hell, and indicating and dealing with him with your own sense of guilt and sin. That shifted. The new mythologies are different today. And we don't worship superheroes per se, but they are still a guiding force for many young people. And uh, the large ones today, of course, are in the DC universe, the Marvel universe. This is a portrait here from uh, Alex Ross, considered the Michelangelo of the superhero industry. Very detailed in his artwork, almost to the point of uh, realism. 
And of course, I have the posters here where you see the Spider-Man, the Captain America, and of course, the unworthy Thor. Fascinating how the genre has changed and is growing. Now, uh, in addition to, of course, DC, there's the Marvel genre, which boasts about 7,000 plus characters and is growing well. It's growing. The movie industry in this regard, especially with the Marvel and DC, is topping the five charts of the most uh, advanced and uh, special effects wise and most well made films. In addition to the money they're bringing in, it's in the top five in the world. <laughs> So they are making a difference in culture. We need to engage those people on that level and how they affect us and how, they, how, that, how that works. Now, Louis Marcos, and I would, I'm going to be recommending some wonderful literature on this regard. Uh, Louis Marcos wrote a lot of, on this, and he, there are two books for him, Heaven and Hell and From Achilles to Christ, where he argues that although Christ is the incarnate of God, the incarnation of God on earth, he is the truth of God with a capital T. He is not the only truth of God. God also speaks in different ways, in different methods to different people groups. He speaks through the pagans, as Lewis himself would say. Uh, he, Lewis, for example, came to uh, Christ through the redemptive myths, and I'll talk about that later. If you were to read the myths of Plato and others, you'll see uh, shadows of the Messiah in them. And I'll, I'll point those out to you later as you see it. It, it, is, it is really fascinating. Uh, has anybody ever seen the Chick Tracks? So I was about 14. I was with my parents at the grocery store. And uh, I was really contemplating the mysteries of life because a, a, a month later, I would start contemplating suicide and start to almost start to, start to commit it because I was on the verge of uh, intellectual, spiritual depression. Intellectual, spiritual, not psychological, if that makes sense. I just saw the world itself as coming to an end for me as an individual. No matter how good I get, no matter how powerful I get, no matter how much money I make, no matter how much influence I have, I will die one day. So what's the point of even starting the process? So I contemplated that and really thought about it. And the Lord planted something in my path, a chick track, which actually tells you the gospel. I picked it up as a child and began to read this and was mesmerized by it because I'm already in the comic industry. And that changed me. And later on, a lot of other events come God and together to do that. So in this particular talk, what I will be doing is giving you four, if I may, powers that have been used by the superhero genre to affect our culture. Four powers. And these four uh, are going to be systematically given in chronological order, of course, and then we'll open up for discussion later. The first one is the power of the visual, and it is profound. According to Krista Nahir, the human brain can process images up to 60,000 times faster than words, according to the Visual Teaching Alliance. Our eyes can register 36,000 visual images an hour, and we get the sense of the visual scene in one-tenth of a second. You're not even aware of what you're seeing before you see it, after you see it. Equally important, the interesting thing about visuals is that they transcend cultures. So if I were to give you a book, you would have to know the language. But if I give you an image, you can get a pretty good idea. Of course, uh, there are some nuances there with what these images are, but it transcends language. Not only that, according to the National Center for Biotechnology, information is uh, coming to us at a exponential rates, especially with the, what you have in your hands, the mobile devices. The next generation of millennials are born with them in their hands. They're born as babysitters to a lot of the children. So technology is infused in their brain, creating what neuroscientists call neural pathways in the brain. These neural pathways send off in dopamines and epinephrines and others that actually form a type of addictive uh, connection to the visual in ways that the previous generations never dreamed. So you have this ability that the technology industry is using to engage the younger generation and it's working at profound levels. The power of the visual is not to be underestimated. Matter of fact, according to the National Center for Biotechnology, which I mentioned earlier, uh, the average attention span of the adult is about eight, seven to eight seconds. A goldfish is nine. The National Center for Educational Research revealed that the Western civilization has become more and more dependent upon visual culture, visual artifacts, visual communication as a mode of discourse and a means of developing social and cultural change. 
I don't know if any of you have been on Twitter, Facebook, and things of that nature, you know, those addictive substances. If you post a, picture, uh, a, 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 a paragraph, some people read it. If you post a paragraph with a word, double the amount will take a look at it. If you post it with a video, it triples the amount of people reading it. It's not just kids, it's also adults who are also in this industry. The power of the visual is not to be underestimated. And the number one selling comic in the world today is The Killing Joke by Alan Moore. Uh, of course, The Killing Joke deals with the creature known as the Joker, who's a psychopathic killer, but ingenious. And in this particular story, the Joker takes uh, one of Batman's arch uh, friends, or his greatest friend, uh, Commissioner Gordon, uh, just rapes in the, and uh, cripples his daughter, tortures her, and tells him and puts him in a form and in, in a position where he now can take a life, meaning the Joker's life. Why would he do that? Well, he was trying to prove a point. Every one of you, each and every one of us, is at the tipping point between sanity and insanity. Put us in a certain situation, such as the one I just mentioned to you, and you will flip and become just like the Joker. You will also become a psychopath. You will also become wild, is his point. Of course, maybe not to that level, but. You, what is stopping the sane man from becoming insane? And according to this novel, this story, it's one bad day. Is that the case? Something to do about original sin? It's a fascinating read. It's also uh, other books on it. Now, in the book by Alan, uh, Neil Postman, which came out about 20 years ago, uh, the book is fascinating, where Neil Postman talks about the power of the visual, where he says, uh, capitalizes on what uh, McLaughlin calls the medium is a message where he says the message is creating a symbiotic relationship by which the medium influences the message itself. So it's not just the message or the substance of the message, it's how it's actually perceived becomes as important. And we, as a, a culture, as Christians, as believers, as cultural changers, need to recognize the power of the medium, not just the substance and the message you're portraying. I've been to lectures where the presenter has presented some profound information in the most monotone, boring way imaginable. Now, some of us older adults, or other people who focus on these things can get the info. But the younger generation, you lost them in the first six seconds. I'm not just saying this here as I'm looking down at this issue. No, a lot of research has been done about TED's talks, uh, some of the greatest um, uh, talks coming around the world. And the research, the interaction with the audiences, the younger generation loses itself if the presenter is not engaging in the very beginning. Sadly, they miss out on a lot of good things because of that. I recommend that book, even though it's over 20 years old. And of course, this is not new. 355 BC, Aristotle recognized that people would go to the theater, to the plays. And he was wondering, why are people going to see Others attacking each other and uh, going through this difficult death in a play. Of course, it's a tragedy. And then coming back out of it. Why would you want to see others suffer like that? Unless what's happening is something in the brain, which he called catharsis. He called it catharsis because what it is, is and he didn't have that at his time, of course. The dopamine's going off at the brain and when the, you see pleasure sensors going off. And people would have a sense of a rush when you see the danger coming, kind of like going down a roller coaster. And then before you hit the bottom, woo, you go back up. And then the, the rush comes up again as a sense of relief. And that rush is almost addictive, especially for younger generations. And that happens actually with the, um, the visual. And Aristotle recognized that way before you're holding your iPhone, way before your greatest grandfathers did. Let me demonstrate how this works. So I watched this series being a big fan of the Daredevil character. It's actually well done, one of the best Marvel has ever created, if you ask me. It's on Netflix. And uh, after I watched it, I wrote about it. And I'll tell you what happened with that. But let me tell you about Daredevil. So the Daredevil character is Matt Murdock. Matt Murdock is a uh, young boy at nine years old. He had stopped a uh, truck that was coming forward and hit a lady, about to hit a lady. And the truck swerved and dumped some chemicals, toxic chemicals, into his eyes. What ended up happening was those chemicals altered his physical chemistry, <laughs> causing him to have extremely heightened senses, where he's able to hear sounds of heartbeats across the room and tell whether somebody's even lying. He took up a career as a lawyer 
later on. Hey, works well for him in the courtroom. And what he realized is he went through the process of getting his law degree, which caused him to have intense discipline to do this. That some justice is just not done in the law, in the courtroom. He had to take it to the streets. So he learned to master his body with the highest forms of martial arts he can get, in addition to learning some type of sonar with his abilities. And he went out on the streets and became this character called the Daredevil. Now what's interesting about the Daredevil is not his, all his abilities, which are fascinating, but that he actually prays. He seeks uh, wisdom from God and from uh, uh, the church where he goes to ask for confession. I thought, wow, in the comic industry, this is good. They don't emphasize it enough, and especially in a show created uh, by Hollywood there. So what I did is I wrote about it, just on the blog, so I maintain a blog. There it is. Logicallyfaithful.com is my website. You're welcome to go there. And if you do go, you get a, there's a free uh, ebook called 10 Things Science Cannot Do, uh, Blind Spots of Science, which caused some interesting uh, schizophrenic fits by some of my naturalist friends uh, when they looked at this. What? you say science can't do something? Yeah, yeah, there are some things science can't do. And so I wrote about this. Now here's what happened. The very next day, I got an invitation in Manhattan, New York, with the producers of the show, the Daredevil show. I'm not kidding you. The next day, after I wrote this, okay, well, people are actually reading this. There's me. I'm the token philosopher there with the, the others. And what we did is discuss how can we use redemptive qualities in the arts to make a difference for culture, to really affect culture in a positive way. And they actually wanted feedback on that. I did my best. One of the uh, individuals in history that I mentioned is Dostoevsky, the uh, brothers Karamazov and other writings. And he said the following, which I found to be important and profound, because it goes against one of the myths in the uh, media industry, which is this. Uh, when they produce films that have um, malevolence, violence, vices that are glorified, one of the defenses they'll give you is, that's just culture. And all we're doing with the culture is trying to just give them what they believe, right? That's what they're doing it anyway. So we have adultery, we'll just show adultery. They have rape, we'll just show that. Extortion, we'll sell. But here's the problem with what Dostoevsky said. He said, at first, life imitates art. Excuse me, art imitates life. Then life will imitate art. And then, find its very existence from the arts. Young generations start now mimicking and taking into themselves the characteristics of those they see in the scenes, on the films, in the books. It is profound and the ability these people have to affect culture is under, underestimated by many of us Christians. We need to engage that level. And I mentioned that to them, and a lot of them took that to heart to say, thank you for telling us we'll, we'll do what we can. I was like, praise God, we'll, we'll work on that. All right, we'll go for it. Well, let's go to power number two. So power one, number one was the visual. Power number two deals with uh, the desire for justice. There is no man, woman, and child alive anywhere who has not had a desire for justice. I had little kids. How many of you have those little munchkins? Okay, so when you have them playing together in the pen and they're hardly able to even speak, one of the first words they learn is, it's mine, that's not fair. They never took a seminar on uh, the, the details of justice and the wonders of ethics. They don't have to. It's been bred in them. They already know that that's my toy, not yours. Uh, because it's a sense of justice at the young age, and of course it increases and it becomes more profound. And the, the cat, Batman character, which is probably now more famous than the Superman character and making a lot more money for the DC industry than them. And the Batman character is fascinating because he deals with that issue at a profound level because of something that tragically happened to him. By the way, if you ever find at a secondhand store this, you will have come in with over $1 million plus. It's a book that was released in 1963, I believe. Uh, 1969, 1939. Bob Kane and Bob Finger created the Batman. And basically it's a character who takes on the mantle of a bat to fight as a vigilante at night. And the kids have been fascinated by it. And the Hollywood industry has capitalized on it. The Batman character has been uh, given different renditions throughout uh, the, the industry. Lewis Wilson was the first guy who did this. Then you have Robert Lowry, Adam West, 
which really, in my opinion, really hurt the Batman genre, but that's okay. That was a part of the uh, campiness of it. And then you have Michael Keaton who, via Tim Burton who took on the mantle of the bat that way. After that, you have George Clooney, uh, Val Kilmer, and jo Christian Bale, which was my favorite. And now, this gentleman has taken on the mantle. You all recognize him? Anybody yeah. know his name? Ben Affleck, that's right, Ben Affleck. He's taking on the new Batman character. And Ben Affleck, hopefully he does a better job than some of these others, we'll see. Uh, Bob Kane, the creator of the Batman, check this out. I was researching this and I found his tombstone. And look what it says on it. Bob Kane, AKA Bob Kane, uh, Robert Kane, AKA Bob Kane. Listen to this. God bestowed a dream upon Bob Kane, blessed with divine inspiration and a rich imagination. Bob created the legacy known as the Batman. Introduced in May 1939, comic book Batman grew from an acorn to an American icon. A hand of God's creation, Batman and his world personify the eternal struggle between good and evil, with God's laws prevailing at the end. Isn't that uh, awesome to see the, um, the creator of one of the greatest icons being somebody who would, uh, would uh, well, theoretically bowed his knee to God? Then again, they always write these things that are Tombstones, how many of us really believe them? But nevertheless, I found it to be fascinating. The Batman character comes from a family who are a billion or trillionaires, and he has an arsenal of uh, uh, weapons and weaponry, enough to make a lot of the militaries in the world envious. Matter of fact, in Chicago, where I, where I live, I'm from Jordan, I live in Chicago, uh, I see some of these uh, makeshift Batmobiles moving around, and people are spending a lot of money on these. I don't know, it's a midlife crisis. Something to that effect. <laughs> but come on, 18 mil for this? But this is just a, if there was a real Batman, that's what it would, it would cost. And the Batman character started off again, nine years old, walking down an alley with his parents, going to see the movie Zorro. And a gentleman came out of the darkness and demanded their uh, clothes, um, their, their gold jewelry. And he became afraid and fired his gun twice, killing his parents. The, the Bruce Wayne, the young man, falls on his knees and begins to make a uh, change in his life. With the vast wealth of his parents, trains himself to peak, peak per, uh, personal perfection, learning all the major martial arts, Kung Fu, <coughs> Judo, uh, Karate, and others to train himself with some of the best trainers in the world. Takes that wealth and builds himself this arsenal to become this um, vigilante to fight crime at night because he has a longing for justice. And if any of you have read Immanuel Kant, one of the greatest philosophers who has ever lived, Immanuel Kant argued that the, he doesn't necessarily say that reason can lead you to God, but justice does. In order for you to have justice in the universe, you must have a being who's intelligent enough to see what's happening, powerful enough to bring about goodness, and wise enough to see the intricacies of the motivations of the villains and the good people and the victims. All at once. Guys, the only person who qualifies for this, the only one who has it on his resume, is God. And I use this as an avenue to talk about the importance of justice being impossible in a naturalistic world. Because actually, at the end of the day, no matter how many villains you fight, you can still lose. But as Bob Kane's tombstone said, no, God's law will win at the end. And that can only happen where good wins if the good is in the center of the universe. Power number three. So I got Power one was visual, power two, justice. All right, somebody's listening. <laughs> Thank you, justice. Thank you. Now we're going to part three. Power three is the supremacy of identity. The supremacy of identity. Now, every superhero has a secret identity, right? Well, most of them do. And here, this is a question we ask. Now, Shakespeare said something interesting. He said, um, life is a play, and we are the actors. We all wear masks in one way or another. The person you're seeing sitting next to you here, is that the real person? Is there a deeper a persona that they don't let out? Deeper hurts, deeper desires, deeper dreams? No, we don't take our masks down to everyone, do we? We don't share our laundry with everyone, that would be insane. But are there any, is there anybody in my life I can take my mask down and share my real self with? So I use that as an avenue to communicate with my secular colleagues. The, the issue of personal identity. Because the characters themselves in the genre are interesting because they take on these traits, like the Bruce Wayne character. Does he become more alive? Does he become more of himself when he puts on the bat cowl at the end here? 
Is that who he really is? Take the Kal-El character, Superman or uh, Clark Kent. Who's the real guy here? Is it Clark Kent or is it Kal-El, the Superman character? Which one is the real identity? And take this particular one, which is fascinating. I mentioned him earlier. You guys know who this is, right? <laughs> okay, the Incredible Hulk. The Incredible Hulk is a scientist who transforms into this, bee, this beast when his uh, chemistry is altered, when he has intense levels of stress and anger. So he has to keep fighting this Hulk within him, this beast within him, this other side of himself that keeps trying to overcome him and causing him to do what he shouldn't do. Does that sound familiar? This is St. Paul, it's in Romans. It's called the old man or the flesh. I have to keep fighting the flesh, keep fighting the old man because he's going to keep rising up in me. And I have to keep killing him, but he keeps coming back. Which is interesting and ingenious of God. So when he redeems us, he leaves the old man in there. He leaves the Hulk. Why? Why don't you just change me, Lord? I do, but I'm leaving him. Because in fighting the old man, you grow your character. You become better than you've ever been. The fight increases your character to a higher potential of Christ-likeness. If you read James, you'll see that in there. The X-Men series are fascinating. They're also Marvel. The X-Men characters are, uh, Stan Lee, the creator, said he made them uh, to be born with their powers because he got tired of trying to invent stories of how they got their powers, like a spider biting them or explosion. So he said, let's make them born with it. And interesting, it started a whole genre of people called the mutants, which began to come together to, uh, because of the persecution in society. People would look down on them. People would marginalize them. People would... Um, talk about them when their backs are turned because they look different and they acted different and they talk different. Does that sound like anything familiar? A lot of the minorities in the world, especially young kids in minority groups, would emphasize and um, uh, have a, a, a connection to these characters because they feel marginalized too. But what's interesting is in the pop culture, the uh, LGBT movement, the gay, lesbian, transgender, and I don't know other ones that keep adding to that, um, also identified with them, saying we're marginalized too for who we are. And a lot of the characters have been using that as a backdrop to express their, their identity. The issue with identity is fascinating because you need to ask people, what is your true identity? Is it just your sexuality? Can you really reduce your entire being to just your sexual nature? Isn't that reductionistic and animalistic? Aren't you more than like your sexuality? So I had a friend of mine who became a friend later. We were talking and I told him I'm doing some lectures on philosophy and ethics and, and evil. And he said, has it have something to do with the church and Christianity? He said, yeah, so you're welcome to come. He said, no, I can't go. Well, so I'm pretty bold. Come on, you gotta come. He said, I'm going to hell. Well, I haven't heard that, why? He said, I'm gay. And I've been told that God hates me and I'm going to hell. So I can't go to a church or go to any event like this. Where did you hear that? I said, but this is who I am. So do you really believe all you are is your sexuality? Aren't you much more than that? God loves you. He loves me. But he doesn't want me to stay the way I am. He wants me to change and grow. God doesn't hate you, brother. Anyway, he left, and he wrote me later that he was crying when he, uh, he went home. He never heard anybody tell him that. A lot of times we do marginalize people, but we have to keep in mind that the identity issue is something that's subsuming and moving like a virus throughout the media telling this is who you are, you got to be who you are. What do you mean who you are? Tell me about who you are. Let's break that down. Let's open up the discussion about who we are. What does that even mean? Um, if you were to go back in the classics, uh, John Locke wrote a wonderful book called The Essay Concerning Human Understanding. And in it, John Locke argued that being a person is a lot more than just your body. Matter of fact, John Locke argued it's more than even your mind or your soul. It's the continuity of memories that make you who you are throughout the continuity of your life. And what are these memories? If the memories are negative, false, hurtful, I start to take on that persona. And my hurt, my pain starts to come out of me into negative ways to deal with other people. So I could deal with that. See how I use the superhero genre for this? You can use that yourself as well in the area of personal identity. Coming to the last part here, the last one. So I got power of the visual, power of uh, justice, identity, and finally, the influence of their mythologies. That should be on the app if you have the outline there, but also I'm giving you this.
the influence of their mythologies. So one of the questions we need to ask, and my students would ask me is, what essentially, professor, is the difference between mythology and theology? Come on, what's the difference, Prof? Well, if you were to read these things in detail, and if you were coming to it from an atheistic or naturalistic point of view, they're just both stories. One is just more detailed than the other. Very elaborate stories. I like G.K. Chesterton who said this. He said that uh, religion, excuse me, theology is uh, what religion does when it uses its brains. That's what theology is. Uh, but mythology is what we want to be real, while theology is what actually is real. Mythology is what we want to be real, while theology is what's real. And sometimes between the, the line between the two shifts. And the ones who capitalized on this a lot are the two greatest uh, writers on it, is Tolkien and Lewis. And Milton, John Milton, and a few others did it as well. And they talked about the power of myth. And myth, in the definition that they give, is not some kind of uh, make-believe story of Jack in the Box or Red Riding Hood. No, it's a lot more than that. Myth is a story that makes sense of life. And Lewis struggled with this because he was a writer and a reader of the great classics in Oxford and Cambridge as well. And Lewis would be talking to Tolkien, and Lewis um, uh, talked to Tolkien about this, who was a very staunch Catholic uh, Christian. He said, Tolkien, I'm having a problem. I want to believe in this God of yours, but I see this coming and rising God in all the literature of the world. I see it in Osiris, I see it in Egypt, I see it in the Norse myths. They come, they suffer, they come back, they die, and they come back again. What makes this one different? And Tolkien looked at him and said, Lewis, yes, it's the same. It's a myth too. But it's a myth that became real. It's a myth that walked among us. It's a myth that got dirt under its fingernails and blood on its brow. He was real. And that woke up Lewis, who a few weeks later, I think it was two weeks later, finally gave his life to God in Christ. It took him out theism, then he went to Christianity later. I recommend, if you haven't read his work, Joseph Campbell is considered the top authority on the question of myth. If you haven't read his work, I recommend it. Joseph Campbell's not a Christian per se, doesn't bow his knee to Christ, but he's using the wonders of the truth of God in culture and seeing how that's all in there. My favorite of his books is called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which I find to be absolutely fascinating because in The Hero of a Thousand Faces, he tells the stories of um, the great myths of history and how they all have a certain theme. A certain theme. I'll give you an example of what this is. So here's the, uh, he's called this the monomyth, is what he called it, the monomyth. The monomyth goes as follows. This is a template for all major movies as well as all major mythologies. And I'll use the example here of, um, anybody know the name Luke Skywalker? <laughs> okay. So Luke Skywalker is this child, this kid, this boy from an unknown village and from an unknown family in another part of the remote part of the universe. He gets a call from on high outside of space, where his space and time is, to get up and make a difference, to get up and receive a message of rescue. He, he struggles with it and he goes through a period of temptation, a period of trial to overcome that. He does uh, through difficulty. And then he faces his greatest enemy, who happens to be Darth well, Darth Vader is the most infamous villain out there, right, in the mythology of the Star Wars. He faces Star, uh, Darth Vader, who creams him, wipes him out, beats him, cuts him up, cuts his hand off, and throws him into a pit, or he falls into a pit to his death. Then Luke goes through um, other, uh, a transformation period, and he comes back stronger, better than ever before, and defeats the enemy. Matter of fact, he does something better than defeat him. He redeems him. And then he comes back to his village and redeems and helps bring uh, order to the universe. Does that sound familiar? Look at the story. Do you see the Messiah story there? Guys, I'm fascinated by this. It's in almost every theme and every character and every, the and every legend in the world. I'm convinced that the Lord God Almighty in his absolute genius had put his story in the heart of each and every man, woman, and child. And no matter what story they write, no matter how elaborate it is, either way, one way or another, they start following some kind of theme which talks about suffering, pain, uh, justice needing to be done, a hero rises up from nowhere, the hero suffers, the hero cr gets crushed, the hero rises again, crushes the enemy, and brings salvation and peace to all of us. 
It's an avenue, guys. It's an avenue. Let's use it to engage our world. And the superhero myths are no different. So I interviewed Adam Barkman on my podcast. Anybody know what a podcast is? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, it's called Logically Faithful. It's free. It's on iTunes and other areas. And Adam Barkman is a scholar from Canada, and he wrote a book called Imitating the Saints, where he compares a superhero genre called philosophy, Christian philosophy and the superhero mythology, where he takes this monomyth and explores it more, and the theories and the heroes of uh, the, 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 the superhero myth. Take a look at that if you're, if you're so inclined. Now, as you are researching and looking into these, whether you're analyzing the great myths of history, like The Matrix, which is one of my favorite films, uh, it's actually a series of three films, and then you have Mithras, of course, the Superman character, which was created by two Jewish men in New York, who named him after, actually after God, Kael. El is the root word of one of the names of God, and his parents were Kael, Jorel, and his name is Kael. He was born to two uh, parents who actually sent him off to the earth to be raised by human parents, which originally were named Mary and Joseph. They changed it to Martha and uh, Jonathan now. Um, and he grows up to become this figure that brings inspiration to everyone. The Thor character is similar. You can see his themes there and others you can take a look at. It's fascinating. And they all betray something. They talk about the myth that became real. And that is our opportunity to talk about this, uh, this myth that became real, this Christ figure. Now let me close with this um, a paragraph and uh, this quote from N.T. Wright, which I found absolutely fascinating. So Yahweh, or Yehovah, in the, in the uh, tradition of C.S. Lewis, is more than a pagan god, but not less. Christ Jesus is more than Superman or Galactus, but not less. We Christian apologists tend to minimize these parallels. Lewis would argue that we shouldn't be afraid of these parallels. The mystical radiance resting upon our theology is from God. We should not be nervous about parallels of Hercules, Balder, Mithras, and other great characters. The parallels ought to be there. It would be a stumbling block if they weren't. Matter of fact, if you read uh, Mars Hill Address by Apostle Paul, doesn't he talk about the pagans and how they have a sense of the divine even in all their works? And that's uh, Acts chapter 17. And I close with this paragraph by, and this is fascinating, this is from N.T. Wright. He says the following, The pain and tears of all the years were met on Calvary. The sorrow of heaven joined with the anguish of earth, the forgiving love of God stored up in God's future, was poured out into the present. The voices that echoed in a million human hearts, crying for justice, longing for spirituality, eager for relationship, yearning for beauty, drew themselves together in fun, one final scream of desolation. Nothing in all the history of paganism comes anywhere close to this combination of events, intention, and meaning. Nothing in Judaism had prepared us for it, except in the puzzling, shadowy prophecy. The death of Jesus of Nazareth as the king of the Jews, the bearer of Israel's destiny, the fulfillment of God's promise to his people, is either the most stupid, senseless waste and misunderstanding the world has ever seen, or is it a fulcrum on which all of world history turns? <laughs>